centuries ago, the British eight months hard sailing from home. Now, four modern day families, one from England, one from Ireland, one from Tasmania, and an Aboriginal clan from the northeast coast of Australia, travel back in time to relive the birth of the Australian colony. For four months, here in this isolated face hardship, history, and each other in the colony of 1800. Previously on the colony, Kerry and Paul at times decided to take the, the best bit of bark. Morris Hurley and Kerry Honky are at loggerheads over building supply. Winding out a piece of bark. I worry about the health of the community when I've got myself happy. The Irish family's concept of community building gets short shrift. You stay up there, you stay down there, we don't Very move rarely, and we now don't you share. Just get on. You don't get a community by three groups of people living separately, doing their own thing, right? But we're not working on a community to start with, are we? Or are, are we it? not? It's goodbye tents, hollow houses. Every bit of board you have to saw is difficult because the timber is extremely hard. Revolution is in the air. We're not going to touch it, we're going to burn it where it stands. If we're making a decision economy, we, we discuss it and then decide. Excuse me, no. Morris, why don't you just pull your head in? And the Aboriginal clan leave the settlers to their bickering. After five weeks in the valley, relationships between our colonists have reached breaking point. Simmering tensions are about to boil over once again. The flashpoint is the colony's first communal project, a fence. It's supposed to bring them together. What we've decided to do is all the three cows are going to put them together in a communal corral and milk them all together. What we've all done, all the families have come together and we're all going to work for hopefully today and get the majority of this fence done. Morris Hurley from Ireland has been pushing for community projects like this since the beginning. To the others, it's bitterly ironic that he hasn't turned up. He's sent his son Declan and his two convicts instead. With rain threatening, Morris has decided to stay behind to finish roofing his hut. We've sorted all rails out and we're just going to crack on and hopefully get this done today if we can. Not even going back to camp. Liz will just bring us a sandwich out and we're just going to go flat out all day. To make matters worse, the Hurley contingent went for lunch and haven't come back. Hey, John. Yeah. What do you reckon the Irish are, mate? I think they're having the dinner, mate. How long have I been having a dinner for? About an hour and a half, I think. So what do you think they're doing? They're bludgeoned. Bloody Irish. <laughs> Bloody Irish. This is the first team effort we've had. So. Wouldn't like to be relying on them from, from that way. But yeah, I do think they should all be here. Kerry and John are so annoyed they call Morris to account. Fucking two hours off for lunch, well, we've been busting our ass, mate. We were yeah. supposed to do this as a team effort, mate. But, you know, John's annoyed as well as me, yeah. mate. We've been doing it hard and we wanted to try and get this all done today, you know? For all I knew, you were sitting up there having your dinner and having a break. I didn't know that. A couple yeah. of men let the team down and it makes everyone else have to work. I don't know who's doing what, I don't know who organised it. Yeah, we're not getting anything done, but that's the problem, anyhow, mate. At times, it seems that he's working hard to make everyone on the colony hostile yeah, to him. So Morris, our land landholder that, that we're referring to, if you can think of ten ways to piss a whole bunch of people off in a day, sometimes he scores all ten. After the fence is finished, the ongoing dispute between Morris and Kerry about sharing common resources 
kicks off again. We've done the actual fence that were for the cows on the common land. There were some nails left over. And I think Morris has took all the nails what were there. We had nails we were supposed to share. He'd used them. He got the shits and that was it. Well, someone walks up near your camp first thing in the morning and says, I want the third of my nails that you offered me a week ago that I didn't want, but I want them now. And I said, well, that's all we've left. I didn't really say no. I just said, oh, I thought we were going to just go third. And these nails. Well, they all wanted me and we started running and raving. They all wanted me to bloody house. We wanted me to pull them out of the house and all the rest. And I said, Morris, I didn't come here for an argument. I said, I just came in scared of bloody cups and nails. Is someone looking for nonsense? I'm sick of all the <laughs> shit with it, actually. I can't pull the trick lately. So I'm just going to keep my nose out of it, I think. Yeah, it's been a bit of a while this morning. I were in a really good mood this morning, ready to get my floor down and everything. And then more bullshit happening. Community development and our neighbours and getting on that at times has been very, very bad. At times it's been very good. From the very start, uh, I think um, our neighbours, uh, Tracy and, and Kerry Hunky, um, I don't know what way they took us or they took uh, the Stevensons, but they didn't really take to us or them. Everybody been squabbling down there, haven't they? Yeah. Everybody, and I just was really tried to crack on with doing the house. We'll have there. to see what happens now with the squabbling. It's like EastEnders. <laughs> it is, isn't it? We never watch soap operas. No, we've got our own soap opera now, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. Oh, it's funny. Like, it, it makes something good to be going on. Adds a bit of drama. Yeah. Well, it's not about. happening to us, but it's sort of fun to watch it. Other people's relationships deteriorating. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Morris is not the man that he were when, when we first came, met him. He's looking really stressed. And His I'm eyes are fidgety and he's getting really, he's really eaten getting up stressed. by it all. I can tell he is very, very stressed. We noticed that today, yeah. didn't we? And he's a lovely bloke. He is. It's getting he needs to, to calm down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm very argumentative, uh, or, I, or opinionated, or whatever. But I have I, I have opinions on things, and I believe if you don't stand up for what you believe in, those rights will go. And I, I take that literally down to small things um, in, in life that if you don't actually speak when you have a chance to speak or whatever, um, and then. There's no point in you complaining about things afterwards. Oh, I'm a bit disappointed, really. You know, I thought we'd sort of moved on. Looks like we haven't. You can only measure up to your own wherever you put the bar yourself, you know. But obviously, other people put the bar where they want it or think they should be, and they think you should measure up to that. And if you don't, well, we obviously don't. But I'm a big girl, you know, I can cope with that. The Hurleys from Ireland might be under pressure, but they're not about to give up the challenge of living as Australian pioneers. Morris and son Declan have almost finished their hut. After five weeks of cramped living in a tent, they're keen to get out. <laughs> I got four flies. How great is that? Meanwhile, having long discarded their corsets, the Hurley women have decided to modify their 19th century clothes. There's no way I could work with these skirts. Just couldn't do it. So I got the dress, beautiful and all as it was, if you like that sort of thing, and got my scissors out and decided that to hell with it. I was making myself a pair of shorts. Then I could do the work that needs to be done here. European clothing of the early 1800s was totally unsuitable for pioneering women. Without the social pressures of the 19th century, Liz Stevenson is also joining the rebellion. For one, it does do this all the time, so you haven't actually got a, um, anything that stays up there. You lose one hand trying to keep your shawl. As you're walking about, you're either restricted because you can't move in it or it just pops open constantly. So you can't actually ever carry anything anywhere at any time because you've got no hands. I just don't get it, and I'm glad. <laughs> it's, it's the only bugbear I've got, like I say, with everything else, all the living conditions, sleeping conditions, food, uh, monotonous diet that we've had, no problem, but the clothes. 
nightmare. That's why we've ended up kind of adapting Closo that we're still a useful person in the team. Liz Stevenson is no stranger to a hammer back home in Yorkshire. She and John have pitched in together to build the first stage of their hut. Um, the roof, it was quite to lift up. The Stevensons are finding the work hard, but they're really loving it. I feel fitter and less tired. I never thought I thought I'd miss, you know, a computer, a, a TV, anything like that, but beans on toast. I really miss beans on toast. Because the honkies from Australia began with an abandoned hut, they've had time to build a pig pen and establish a vegetable garden. These black bugs are getting into the um, roots of the potatoes and they start chewing on the stalks. Their sow has recently delivered eight piglets, which might be traded or end up on their dinner table. <laughs> it's a monster. <laughs> I went to feed her yesterday and she just ran me straight in the back with a snout, eh? And the honky's convict, Paul, is a handy stonemason who's busy building an outdoor kitchen. He's a, the rock man from hell, mate. As long as he's got rocks, he's happy, I think, that fella. He's building a cob or a pizza oven in common words. A lot easier to work with the old sandstone. Hardest part is getting it all, getting it all down from the hill. Uh, the clay all sort of bonded all together. On the frontier of the early 1800s, hardship and isolation could take a toll on the soul. Some settlers found solace in religion. It's Sunday, and Father Paul Maloney, a Catholic priest, visits the valley. Good morning. <laughs> Maloney. So how did your followers here? The word gets around. And when you hear that there is a Catholic family, then perhaps to make the journey to find them. Well, so priests were sent over as convicts? Yes, in the, to be yes so, or they were suspected of insurrection and things right. like that. So for whatever reason, they came as convicts and, and then uh, when they got their ticket of leave, they were able to act as private citizens and so they, they ministered to the people privately. Where would you like to get her? Or? Out of the smoke. Out of the smoke, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the sun. Maybe over this way. Okay. Okay. I think it'd be nice to just use the shade, huh? Yeah. I don't really want to. It annoyed me having to sing prayers in school, having to sit there and sing about God in school. I don't want to be forced into another situation where I feel uncomfortable for not having the same beliefs as other people. It's our Christian belief that with the coming of Christ into our human history, a light has shone in the darkness. Life has conquered death. One third of convicts in the early colony were Irish, and most of these were Catholic. Catholics weren't allowed to publicly celebrate their mass anywhere in the colony for the first 15 years. And what seems like disaster is transformed by the power of God's love even into this harsh and relenting terra australis. The harsh and relenting part of it is, is very true at this moment as I bring with me this proclamation and it explains the government's attitude towards the Irish. And we're gonna read our books and play cards and have fun. A nice rest day, the Lord's day. And we've lost our two convicts. Can't find them. They've gone AWOL. Otherwise, we'd have them out there in a bonnet making the porridge. You have to ask Kevin. He left. Uh, I don't expect him back. Strange world. <laughs> The 
Creek. All three farms now have fresh water on their doorstep. The water, having fresh water running past is gorgeous. You've not got the tannin that's left from the uh, leaves and everything in the well, um, and it doesn't smell rancid, and we all kept just drinking water. Oh, no, it's brilliant, though, having the water yeah, there is brilliant. Yeah, it's fantastic. Because you, you have fresh water practically on tap. Well, you see, it's mostly women that use the water. We do the washing up, we wash the clothes, the boys are prepare the food, and but the men were drawing the water from the river. So there you've got a, a, a tension there, haven't you? Because they're doing all the hard work and the river's a long way. Not that Hold on, that hold hard. on, hold on. The buckets were heavy. It was a long way to go. They had a very difficult job getting the water up here. Ah, any water? You can turn on a tap and get clean water from a tap you take it completely for granted. But if you mm. take that away and you've got to travel a long distance to get water or you're, you're using dirty water all the time, then it becomes a real problem very quickly. The rain makes planting conditions perfect. Wally Greenhalgh, a local farming expert, brings his horse Tom to show our settlers how to plow, 19th century style. Susan Hurley is keen to try her hand. It's just that it's pretty strenuous work, I think, for a young lady. Not that I've got anything against Susan, but we can give her a go. Now you've got to be ever so gentle, gentle with the reins. Easy, easy, easy. Gently, Tom. Whoa! I think I underestimate what's involved with doing this. She'll do all right, eh? Come round, Tom. Come round. Got the balls, mate, having a go. Good to see. Get up, Tom! Get up, you bull chitter. Get up! In 1800, the main crops on the Hawkesbury were wheat and corn. Keep him straight to let him turn a circle. Settlers often sold their harvest in advance so they could trade for other goods. Tom, get up! Come Bit of family support would give it more confidence. Holden, you want him to go straight? They should be alongside you. In the same way, our colonists will be able to use any crops they grow as currency, as long as they don't fail. Don't have no clutch or brakes, so it's going to be tricky. Well, Tom, well, Tom. Whee! Stand up. Good boy, Tom. That's a boy. The draft horse and plough in the early colony were extremely rare and very expensive. Successful farmers who owned one That's might lend them for a share of the crop. Last lap, Tom. Let's go. Come on, Tom. Whoa, Tom. It just seems so easy. That's because you're not pulling that great big thing. Poor Tom there. Yeah, but let's be honest. The horses have been bred for that. In the early 1800s, one in two farms on the Hawkesbury failed. Success depended on all the family chipping in as the colony kids are doing to sow their first crops of wheat and corn. Totally organic. Yeah, it is. Okay. Completely organic. We'll be able to sell this crop for a fortune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that should get us a fair bit of money for some fruit and veg because we've absolutely got none <laughs> whatsoever. If they don't grow in this, it's never going to grow. Just sown his first crop, quite proud. So we'll see how they go, hopefully. In a week or so, they should be sprouting. In our colony, highly prized fresh fruit and vegetables can only be grown or traded. To get what they need, the Hurleys and the Stevensons have developed a cosy arrangement. The Irish um, have now got their own cow, and they found that they don't like the uh, cow's milk. I'm allergic to it, it gives me headaches, doesn't agree with mum's stomach, and it, it upsets Kate's asthma, so we said, no, it's not good for us. And also we had too much of it, and the Stevensons just seemed to like, not be able to get enough of it. 
So we've done a deal that every day we give them their, our goat's milk and they give us their milk. So we've found that we've got an abundance of milk. So we've gone into cheese production. We're hoping that in two days' time from now we should have a blob of cheese every day. So it would be a really good tradable item. Once we start having cheese, I just don't eat the meat at all. So um, the lads have my share of meat. So we, it's a really exciting time. You're betting on two, Kate, are you? Yeah. Definitely. On her little farm, Kate Hurley has been waiting patiently for their goat Blackie to give birth. He's sticking his tongue out there. Okay, it's a girl. It's a girl. It's her tongue. Oh, there we go. <laughs> same colouring as the mother, isn't she? Really? The ears and the face, exactly the same as the mother. Look at the legs. Look at her little legs. Look, look. That is brilliant. Shortly after the flood, the extremes of Australian weather hit hard when the temperature climbs to over 40 degrees Celsius. As our colonists endure the hottest October day on record, recently forgotten tensions are reignited. The heat also imposes a 21st century phenomenon, the total fire ban, which gives the honkies the upper hand once again. There's a um, total fire burn today, so that will make um, life in the colony a bit um, interesting. Since there's only two um, places suitable for a fire today, both here at the Aussie camps. The Poms made a comment to someone the other day that the Aussies had nothing that they wanted to trade with, so it uh, depends on if I'm, uh, we feel um, big heart and let them use a fire or just be... Assholes. <laughs> we'll just wait and see. I'm still not really talking to Morris too much. So, uh, whether they come over and be polite about it at all, they certainly can use our fire. Up at the Stevenson's camp, the news is welcomed with typical Yorkshire cheer. We woke up today and we found out that there's a total fire ban. But it's very exciting being in a fire ban because we've never been in a fire ban. And We've been in a raging torrent and a fire ban. Yeah. From one extreme to the other. With the only enclosed fire in the valley, everyone must deal with the Australian family. Well, we've got to go and see the honkies this morning anyway. We'll give them the chicken, see if they'll cook it, and they'll give us half. The Stevensons hope their recently killed chicken can be cooked on the honkies fire. Where's Tracy? We just wanted to cast a professional eye over our chicken. I reckon we should tie you to a tree as a fly trap, mate. It's looking a bit stiff. Nah. No good? Nah. Oh, I guess the flies win. No. I don't have much to do with cooking. I was just thinking chicken, chicken, chicken. <laughs> if this fire ban lasts for a week, then we've got no fire for a week. Mm. That's the thing. So I was thinking if... The temperature in the colony rises even further when the honkies insist that their fire comes at a price. Like when we had milk, we give you milk for the kids, and we were, no, didn't want anything. Choice, yeah, but you know what I mean? John, use, both families have known I've been desperately needing slabs of wood since, yeah. since we've been here. Right. Well, I, I know, it's not a question of pointing no. the finger, it's just a question of what have we got to work with. We've got two fires here. That's okay. fine. That's fine. No, no problem with that. Right? That's okay in 2004, uh, yeah. Tracy, when you've well, got other you alternatives, you know. But we're entitled to our opinion. Why can't you just work with the bloody trade? The Hurleys see the honkies wanting to gain advantage from the fire ban as yet another example of their failure to embrace a spirit of community. You heard their attitude? I think to use um, yeah, no, leave us, don't a situation like this. Don't. To try don't. and don't, don't get hostilities thing. going again, I think that's pretty, pretty low, actually. If I had a fire, and, and the honkies band, they have two fires. If I had a fire in my house and the fire band came in, I would go to my neighbours and I would say to them, listen, I have a fire, there's no problem. Come up any time you want and do your cooking. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, that's the way I would do it. Yeah. I know I would do it like that. I wouldn't automatically just think, hey. Even the film crew 
feels Morris's frustration. Meanwhile, Tracy reconsiders her family's position. The men seem to be in the macho he-man crap going on, so I think if we all network a little bit more... I think it has to depend on the women, actually, yeah. to do the deal. We're um, just going to do the communal cooking until we find out what's going on. Rather yeah. than trying to share one small fire with everybody's three pots, we'll just do communal cook tonight and then Tomorrow either me, Trish or Liz and, and make up a couple of dampers through the, during the day and just do that. After the women sort out the fire ban situation, everyone in the valley has dinner at the Honkies. Except Morris. The colonial government in Sydney kept a watchful eye on its money through a network of informers. In the wake of the convict rebellion of the war, hint of what? Quick march. Check, look out the door. Our 21st century colonists have been foolish enough to nail their colours to the mast. An historical reenactment group has come to teach them a lesson in history. <laughs> Nobody would have laughed under these circumstances in 1804. Ford. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Ford. Arms. The appearance of redcoats on your doorstep was never. We are hereby commanded, the honky of the Hawkesbury, to appeal the magistrate's court to answer the complaint of performing actions of an inflammatory and seditious tendency with the intention to disturb the tranquility of this colony. Private, flag. Beg your pardon? I what? Suddenly, no one is laughing anymore. Tracy Honky is emotionally attached to her handiwork. Well, it took a lot to make that flag. No. I wasn't wanting him to take that away. Hey, what are you doing, pal? Get it! I got it. Hey! Jesus. Pick up, come on. Well, you can carry it, but you can come with us. Take it easy. March. <laughs> I'll look after her, mate. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll look after him. <laughs> In this day and age, Kerry and myself, neither of us handled authority really at any level. We're the type of people who would have been incarcerated fairly quickly back in those days of being overpowered with a fairly severe brutality. Not shot or hung or whipped to No, no, sir. We are hereby commanded to summon Morris Hurley to answer the complaint of performing actions of an inflammatory and seditious tendency with the intention to disturb the tranquility of this colony. Hey, class. Hey, I was dancing. Look. Pretty disturbing. <laughs> Private. <laughs> what actions? What actions? Rubbish. It's bullshit. He's taking my flag. Horace Hurley, will you come with us, please? I'm with us, sir. It's a game for Morris and Kerry. Running from the redcoats wasn't an option for the original colonists. New South Wales was still run giant. There was no The big bright red coats and the, 
the, you know, the shiny boots and the big, huge guns and the tall hats would have looked really intimidating, I think. Yeah, I think it was fair enough. We were told by the proclamation not to put up, you know, Irish flags and practice our Catholicism and all that. The British regiment in the early colony was the New South Wales Corps, now more infamously known as the Rum Corps. Using rum as currency, they controlled virtually all trade in the colony and came down hard on free settlers who threatened their racketeering. Redcoats, tops, cap, dad, and carry. Even dad. Get off our land before you infect us. They put a flag. Yeah. They were, um... So they took them away? Yeah. yeah. That would be quite round here then, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> and Dad and Kerry oh, made a run for it through the, through the trees. And we were the only yeah. free man now left in the colony. Well, they're both squealing like pigs. Your man was a bit scary, actually, wasn't he? The guy that read yeah. the, the corporal took out this um, proclamation. proclamation. So we don't know how long they're gone for. Don't know. Place and see in this place, that's for sure. You never know what's around the corner, do you? Once arrested, colonists suspected of rebellious activities would be brought before a magistrate. A free settler could receive jail time. An Irish exile would most likely end up banished to Norfolk Island. It was intimidating. And I'd say back at the time, it probably was one of the worst things that could have happened to you as a family to have these guys arrive in your home and take anything. If you think about where an Irish family, they would have thought probably that they'd have left all that behind them in Ireland. Oh, this is homely for a sheep or a pig. Horse, say a horse. horse you they probably would have been intimidated by the English authorities and the redcoats at home. I mean, the uncertainty that must have caused for the family to take somebody away like that. It must have been really frightening. Could be a long time before the judge gets here. Oh, this one, I didn't fool him. <clears throat> In the early 1800s, this lockup was used to cram up to 35 convicts at a time. Oh no, Kerry and Morris, that's just not a good match to start with, you know. There's been that build up between the two of them. They don't really communicate at all. It'll be very interesting. I'd love to be a fly on the wall just to see, you know, what, what happens because I don't think there is really any love lost there between them. With really like each other. Anyway, out there? Not unless you can get very, very small. Some of the people don't listen because I might appear to be abrupt or self opinionated or whatever. I think that's why I go through life. Have a bit of a spit and a dummy spit and, you know, throw a few cursive words around. And... The rain to flood for seven days and seven nights. The original clan prize return. And everyone races to prepare for the governor's inspection. I decided not to wear one of those corsets because it's going to be just too hot, so I've done a homemade bra. I'm a bit pissed about the hat that they give me, Kerry. I'm not sure this is really my style, mate. Under the instructions of Governor Bly, the magistrate and his inspection party have arrived. 